However you are and whenever you are, welcome good souls of the planet and beyond to Paranormal Now. I'm Alan B. Smith. Join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. Uh, joining me tonight for our second episode of 2021 is Sierra uh, Neblina, and she'll be joining us in just a few minutes. Um, and tonight is our first night on Sundays at 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. So this is great. Stay tuned for Tracy Austin after this live airing of Paranormal Now on KGRA, the best in alternative talk radio. Um, so in the last half an hour, we will open up the phone line. So to access the Paranormal Radio app phone line and ask your question of myself or a guest tonight, um, call later, 855-472-5483. That's one uh, KGRA live. So, um, yeah. Yeah, this has been a, um, a really rough ride this past week. And, uh, you know, as, as most of you know, we don't, we don't do top politics. Um, I'm paranormal now, unless it's exopolitics, of course. And, uh, but how do you not comment on what's happened? Right. Um, I try to stay as neutral as I can during uh, this show because that's important to me because there's so many of us with different beliefs. Um, this is a great place for us to come together and have shared ideas and thoughts, um, camaraderie here. And, um, you know, it's a place where we can challenge each other's um, assumptions or ideas, theories, and it's okay. You know, if if my theory is a little crazy or yours is a little crazy, that's all right. You know, we'll we'll talk about it here. That's what we do. Um, but what happened this past week at the Capitol was just absolutely egregious. Um, it was terrifying to watch. It was terrifying to watch the videos that have been releasing afterwards. Um, we saw behavior that was surprising. We don't understand why certain doors were opened and let in while at other doors, you know, those doing their duty were holding their line. It's very confusing. And I can understand how when we're all really, really angry, I, I can tell you that I'm really angry about what happened, that we want answers. How did this go down the way it did? I'll, I'll say this, and for those of you who interact with me on, on Facebook, and I'd taken a, a hiatus for a while with political commentary, um, mainly for my own mental health, because I, I just, it wasn't helping me to just be angry, to argue on Facebook. Um, and sometimes our emotions get the best of us. And I will be the first to admit if my own emotion or bias gets in the way of good judgment. So, you know, if if you are one of those people uh, who I interact with on Facebook uh, civilly, you know, I hope that you you recognize that and that I recognize that in you and that we can um, challenge each other. Send me a link, I'll send you a link. Let's talk about it. You know, what do you see? What are you hearing? What am I hearing? From everything that I have seen so far, um, not, what happened was wrong leading up, moments leading up to those events. And I've said it on this program so many times before, you know, words matter. What you say matters. How you say something matters. Whether you're being straightforward or you dog whistle, you know, whatever it is, words matter. And, you know, Stan Lee, um, I think, represented this best in uh, Spider-Man comics, right? Uncle Ben... You know, what was his, his famous words? Um, with great uh, power comes great responsibility. And so when you have power, when you have influence, when people look up to you, um, you be careful of how you say what you say, because there are consequences. That said, um, in some of those arguments that I've had online about how the National Guard has responded, I go and look to the video by the governor of Maryland and his explanation as to why there was a delay. Now, we can argue about was there something else going on behind the scenes that I am unaware of. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. But you have to provide the evidence to me. You have to show me that 
something else was wrong. Something was going awry in the line of command. And um, from what I can tell, I'm going on not political punditry. You know, I don't care about what some late night journalist host on MSNBC says. I don't care what the one on Fox says or CNN. I don't. You know, I don't let other people's opinions that mesh with with so-called journalism shape my opinion. I'm I'm just looking at video, I'm looking at facts, and I'm looking at statements. And I am really angry with what happened. And it's just so sad. Like, how, how is this America, right? How do we get to this place? And I think I think a lot of that, the onus is on us because we need to learn how to communicate better to each other. You know, if you disagree with me on Facebook, show me a link, talk to me, tell me, be civil. But if you tell me I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, if I attack you and say you're stupid, you're a crazy lefty lib or whatever, how is that going to help the argument? My argument, how are we helping it? We're just push, pushing each other up against walls and there's no reconciliation there. And, and America, what what is going on? Like it's, we can get angry at all the politicians, but we, the people have got to figure out a way to better communicate with each other, especially when we disagree. It, it's critical, you know, I mean, here in the, in the UFO community, we've had um, some great ufologists make some claims that have turned out to be totally bogus. And, you know, if it was a one-time thing, if they apologize for it, you know, we move on. We, you know, most of us, we forgive and we move on. We give people another chance. And um, the, the point is you, you can't, if you attack someone uh, and I don't care what side you're on and you th- assume that that person is 100% evil and that you are 100% right. Well then h- how can we even have a conversation at that point? Um, the top, the topic of the social media platforms that's important to us, right? Because we talk about some really out there stuff. And so we don't want to be edited. We don't want people to take us down because we're talking about some conspiracy theories. But if I say something that could instill violence, if you say something that could instill violence in the chat room, if you say something egregious, insulting, assaulting, just low in the chat room. I have the right to monitor you and remove you. And so does KGRA. If KGRA doesn't like what I say, that's KGRA's choice. And so there's a difference between what as businesses you can do as far as free speech is concerned versus what actual free speech is and how the constitution protects us. And those are two separate arguments. And I see some confusion there. Um, and again, I think that, you know, we have to come to the, to the table with each other and, and really be honest about what free speech is and how do we move forward in this new era where these social media, you know, platforms are huge. They have such huge influence. Um, and so it is a sort of a giant town square in a sense, but they are private businesses at the same time. So it gets tricky. Um, but let's not confuse what actual free speech is, which means the government can't come after you and arrest you for you know, what you, what you say, you know, unless I guess the one exception would be um, hate speech, right? If you're, if you're directly causing violence or or something of that, that concern, but for the most part, we have free speech. The government should not be able to come after you for things that you say, even on this program, you know, we, we, we have conspiracy theory topics that challenge the status quo and um, no one tells us we can't talk about it. That's free speech. Uh, So I know some of you are probably going to be uh, disagreeing with me and that's fine. And I invite you to to share, you know, your grievances, but let's let's do it as maturely as possible. Because I'll I'll learn from you if you if you you know speak with to me with respect and I speak to you with respect. You know, that's that's just how this goes. So um let's stay together as best as we can. Um and I just want to say that, you know, some of us might be wrong most of the time, some of us might be wrong some of the time. But none of us are right all of the time. And so I I just want to take a minute here. Um, it's been a rough year. And uh, I just want to take a minute to honor 
all those who have fought for us, for our military, SEAL, sea, land, uh, and air members, for the police, uh, the lives lost to serve this country, for those who fight for equality, for those who are servants of all kinds, you know, that you help us move forward as a nation. You help protect us and you keep this democracy, this republic, safer and intact. And so I just want to take one minute of silence here and I hope you'll join me to reflect on those. All right. Well, it's been a, a trying time this year. There are many lives that have been lost, and we won't forget you. Um, in just a moment, we'll bring Sierra on here. As soon as we can get her in, we had some technical problems, uh, it seems, getting her connected. Um, so, Bill, if you can reach out to Sierra, see if we can't get her on video, if we can get her um, on the phone, and we'll try to bring her in, um, you know, audio style, <laughs> the way that uh, we used to on Paranormal Now back in the day. Um, and for the, all of you who are familiar uh, with Paranormal Now, you know that it started off as a as a podcast on the Inception Radio Network um, and then bounced around from platform to platform, ended up here on KGRA, thankfully, thanks to, to um, Carol Carl, Race Hobbs, Bill Skywatcher. Um, and I'm very grateful to share this time with you and this air with you. So let's see if we can bring Sierra on. Sierra, how are you? Oh my goodness. I don't know what's with this technical stuff. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Yeah. Welcome. Oh, it's completely jumping on my end here. Can Staring you hear us? With the audio. Hey, Sarah, can you hear us? I can't. <laughs> oh my gosh. Just the tip of the, like, the hardest week, right? Like, <laughs> I can't hear you at all. <laughs> okay. Ah. We're okay, gonna, yeah. Try that now. Yes, let's try that now. Can you hear us now, Sierra? I can hear you now. Okay, great. Here we go. Okay. That, that was a great little diatribe. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know how you feel. Um, oh, man. And during these times, yeah, like the little things that's like, why? Why now? You know, it's so uh, annoying. Yeah. Uh, here we are. And, um, you know, we're going to talk about the paranormal now. Um, yes. I promise this is not a political show, and it's very, very... Uh, you're muted, I think. Are you muted? <laughs> this is literally like the playing out of every light worker I know this week. This is funny. This okay, is I can hear you. I can hear you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, wow. Wow. Uh, I don't know if this is meaningful or this is just bad luck, but... <laughs> I think it's... Meaningful. <laughs> Why don't you tell us about um, you know, your background and leading up to your first, I guess, is it fair to say alien abduction? Yes, yes, because okay. that was being yes, that's a, that's a fair a fair description. Okay. So who I am is basically your average Joe. I considered myself to be very grounded and very down to earth, except for the minor difference between me and. A lot of people I know is that I came into this life with a lot of telepathic and telekinetic and different types of things. Like my brain was, I call it having no veil. 
So I came in being able to hear and see and sense things that most people didn't. It was very confusing for me because as a young child, I couldn't tell the difference between a spirit that was trapped on this plane, an angel, an entity, an elemental, or a human being walking around because everybody have appeared to me just as solid as each other. Um, came from a broken childhood. Um, I was taken away by the state and placed into foster care at nine. And that went, that's, that wasn't any better <laughs> situation they brought me out of. But basically, at the age of five, my mother um, had a couple different relationships with a couple different men, and my brother's father, I'm the eldest of, of six, and my um, brother's father, who's four years younger than me, um, is in the military, in the army, and his father was a brigadier general um, out, stationed out of Cape Canaveral, actually, out of the Navy. And I was very, I don't know, attracted to his dad in the sense that there was something spiritual there. There was a light or something or something about him. Um, he, I started talking to him one day about my abilities and what I could see and sense. And the next time I came to stay with grandpa, um, there were men in there, men there testing me with um, blue and white um, cards. And then the next thing I know, I was being taken in, when I'd go visit grandpa, I was being taken to what my mom thought was daycare or hanging out with grandpa, but I was going underground and in tunnels and being sent to various different places and they were testing my abilities. And uh, I was five at the time. You're testing your abilities? Mm-hmm. Yep. What is, what is that like? Um, not fun. <laughs> uh, the MK Ultra Super Soldier Program is what I found myself falling completely smack dab in the middle of. And that was back in 1975. And uh, during this time, they were trying to find, they were really, really researching and digging in. They had already understood the psychic ability, starting with like the movie from, you know, the men who stare at goats back in the 50s, 60s. So they acknowledged that psychic, uh, psychic ability did exist. And they started to try and find out more about that. And so what they were doing was taking um, p uh, adults at first, um, and testing them and that, but they found that children were a lot easier to manipulate. So the younger they could find them with abilities, the better for them. I just happened to be super young at five. Um, so I spent a lot of time underground and them hooking up electrodes, doing different things, testing my remote viewing ability, my astral projection ability and so on. And I think they were trying to learn a lot about that. So um, all this detail that, that you remember. Say about that. Say again. You have a lot of detail that you remember. Yeah, actually, I didn't remember any of this um, until 2013. Somebody said I had already come out and shared my story on uh, the 2012 scenario and started um, really kind of coming on the scene around 2009, 10, 11, 12, sharing my story of the abduction and my uh, my experience with the Greys. But uh, yeah, it. <laughs> I forget my point. I was just going there. What was your comment you had just said? Kind of fragged well, me out a little bit. You remembered so much detail. Oh, the detail. So yeah. in 2013, um, I have um, um, Let's Talk 2012 and Beyond, a radio program on our, uh, Blog Talk Radio mm -hmm. uh, Gal under Galactic U University. And I had built up seven different radio program hosts to come on. So if people would find stuff and they'd send it to me. And Corey Good had just come out as a whistleblower. And he had done his very first interview that he did. I think it was, I don't know, about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 45 minutes. But I only got through the first 18 minutes. When he started talking about being tested by the blue and white cards, something triggered a memory. I likened it to walking into a room and you don't see all the playing cards lay up, like hanging from the ceiling by strings. Each one of those playing cards represents a memory. Or something hmm. they didn't want you to remember, and they I walked. They didn't saying, want you to remember this. This is part no. of their technique. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Of 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 imprinting other memories or trying to falsify memories or trying to make you forget things altogether. Mm -hmm. So when he started to talk, something in what he was saying because 
Randy Kramer had come out before that as a super soldier, MK ultra super soldier program, but he was more, he wasn't the empathic intuitive like I was. He was the, you know, very smart, very capable soldier set type of person without the psychic abilities, although he is very psychic. Um, this was, it was something in the way that Corey Good explained that, that just triggered. It was like as if all of those strings were cut all at the same time and every memory came flooding back in. It was very disorienting. It was very upsetting. I was working on my autobiography at that time and I thought I was done. And then all of those members memories came out and it just threw me for a giant, huge. You're, you're working on your autobiography at, at this point. Mm -hmm. What was the initial story that, that was there that you, were, you needed to write about? Well, just being a sensitive, I've had a lot, a lot of experiences through my life with a bunch of different beings. I've had a, a, a be, uh, interactions with angels. I've had interactions with Bigfoot, other elemental type guardian beings that are here on the planet. Um, and it was more and more of sort of like me to start getting my thoughts together about what is my life about? Why did I come in like this? What? Why are all these crazy things always happening to me? Like... <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. And I think <clears throat> I'd met, um, I don't think I, I, I'd been on the Starseed hotline radio program, then went to the 2012 scenario and then they went, turned into the, the, the Gaia program and I went off on my own, but I was always in search of the answers of what is this all about? And what had sort of brought my name out into the spotlight is in 2009, I started having a lot of bad memories 2010, um, I had in 2007, actually, I had a massive stroke until my heart stopped. And I realized that I when I came back, I had a walk in, there was a lot of crazy stuff happening. And so I went to the paranormal research forum in Denver. And I started talking to people like Stan Romanak and the J3 filmmakers, and really just sort of trying to find out more about myself and then explain to them, I was having all these really bad memories about a situation that happened to me when I was, I think 24 years old mm -hmm. and where I woke up and there was a Zeta, a gray in my room and I was taken aboard ship. Uh, they were messing around with my stomach. I had memories and flashes of being in that particular situation before I woke up. It was such a horrific experience because I was being taken against my will. Now I'd been visited by, and even gone on ship with other beings. I wasn't being taken against my will. I wasn't being made to not be able to move. That's what was so traumatic. And that was, that was what um, my part in uh, Extraordinary the Seating was just talking about the hybridization program with the Zeta Reticuli and how, how our government had made deals um, whether you're in, in the military, your family of a military person, you you give up your body rights. And who are they and making deals with? The Zeta Reticulides, the the Greys from the the star system, the Zeta Reticuli but of the realm. With like family members involved, or just the like who who the government military. Um, so from what I understand, what I was told is back around the time of the Roswell crashes that Roswell was not the only one. There was something like 18 different crashes, purposeful, the military bringing down the craft when they realized they could bring them down by shooting radar and different things at them. There was a coordinated attack by the military to bring down these craft to recover the technology back in the 40s. <clears throat> Roswell wasn't the only crash. It was like 18 in, the same, in a 24-hour period where they were just running around trying to grab up as many beings and technology as, they, as our military possibly could. And in doing so... Uh, got a couple of beings that were still alive. Thus, uh, from what I understand, ensued talks, ensued conversations, ensued the military trying to get technology and a deal being struck. And from what I understand, by some branches of our government with this particular race, that they lost their ability to reproduce a long time ago. And for exchange of technology... Um, supposedly these Zetas, these Greys, uh, gave our government information or technology in exchange to be able to utilize our gene pool. And the reason why I got caught up in it is because I joined the Army and 
your blood can track. They can track your blood in some crazy ways. They can track. We'll get into that later, but um, we'll start out slow. <laughs> but they basically could track and knew my abilities by testing my blood when I went to the military. And so I became up, I came up on a high priority to be taken for that particular list for the genetic program of the Zeta Reticuli. <clears throat> and what's so, the purpose of the, the program? I'm sorry, say again? What's the purpose of the program? Supposedly for the gain of technological advancement for the military and the access to genetic pool of the, of, for the Zetas, for the, of the people on the planet to be able to utilize the women and the men to create their own genetic line. And so when I woke that night and not being able to move and as terrified and everything as I was, as I was, um, it's, you know, a little bit more about people who don't know my story is I'm a lesbian and and have been all my life, really Um, dated very little in high school and just jumped over, uh, realized who I was. And, um, I was pregnant after the, that experience with waking up in the middle of basically the Zetas uh, coming down. And I had already been taken and impregnated. I was carrying a child at that time and I was testing positive and it was freaking me out. I was not happy or I didn't like um, that being done to me against my will. And, and that's what it very much felt like. You shared this in the documentary. Um, yes. The seating. Yes. Uh, Extraordinary the seating. Yeah. I went into great detail about that particular experience and everything that came out of it. It's sort of like a a kind of an accumulation that came to a head um, of me just trying, wondering about myself and my abilities and who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing. And that felt like a violation uh, that being taken against my will and being used in that way. But when I did find out about it, I was living in Manitou Springs um, at the foot of Cheyenne Mountain, (laughs) Colorado Springs, Colorado. And um, I, we are free will beings. We really truly are. And somewhere it was hard for me to wrap my head around this, but somehow I agreed to be a part of all of this. And as I come to understand later on, it's important for people who have experienced this particular, well, who've experienced all the different aspects of UFOs or UAPs or had experiences in person with uh, others that are not from here to come forward and share their story. Because the most important thing for people to get is that they're here. There's not just the Zetas, there's so many other different beings and things. And and it's why I agreed to come on the radio program today is because I think that we're headed very, very quickly to a time where the government's going to start talking about this. You know, we've for years and years and years, I've asked the questions of answer the questions of why, why would they do this? Well, first and foremost, just for their genetic line and their genetic pool. Why would, why would America make these types of agreements? Well, they a race for technology. Where it goes wrong is the fact that the spin-off society um, is, 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 has created a whole other society out there, out in the cosmos and trading and mining and interacting with these beings. And they've left us out. They've left us back here on the planet without all of the technology, the zero point technology, the healing beds, the ability to heal ourselves, to be able to be in perfect health. Well, how do, um, how do we um, find evidence for that? Do you know? Because um, find the, evidence for which part? To support a spinoff society, because uh, I know that you know that that claim has been made um, by people who have been in prominent roles before, but they've but they've never been able to say, look at you know X Y Z. And then here's the the evidence, you know, to to support it, um, you know, and and even someone like Elon Musk, you know, who's made claim that like the pyramids are built by aliens, right? Like it's it's pretty amazing that he would say it, but it's still hard to, you know, present to the mainstream, you know, after, even after it a, is. a decade of ancient aliens, we haven't convinced the mainstream yet um, that that this is going on, right? Well, I mean, I hear I hear you, I totally get you. And what I can say, though, is an observation. The observation that I've been making 
over the last however many years, 10 years, I guess it's been since ancient aliens has come out. Yeah. They have done their job. They actually, if you ask the average Joe on the street, do you really think aliens exist? I believe, and they've done studies about this. You know, just go look it up. Don't take anything I say <laughs> as fact. Please go do your own research. Please use your own discernment, please, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. um, think on your own. But um, go look at, there's so many more people who've started to speak to this, including they're starting to get us ready for it. It's the problem when you're basically going to have to go back in history and admit to people that you've been lying to them for so long. Who's, who takes the fall for not saying anything? At one point, do we force them? So let's start talking about actual things happening. So actual things that are happening is, as of the signature of the last stimulus bill, there was put in that stimulus bill that the uh, Secretary of Defense and any military intelligence has to release anything that they have about um, aliens and UFOs in the next 180 days. Now, the question is, are they going to do that? I well, don't know. You give us another blue book, right? Um, Possibly. Yeah. Or are, but here's the other thing, too. There's a lot of different moving parts of this that I understand personally for, on my own. Mm -hmm. There's a hierarchy out there, sort of like, and the quickest and best and easiest thing to do is just liken it to the TV show SG-1, okay? Imagine if all of a sudden we're a fledgling society and we haven't developed the technology ourselves. We've basically traded for it with, with other advanced alien races. We're going to go out there and start stumbling around and using this technology and bumping into this alien race and that alien race. And the thing about it is about... I, I don't even want to get into the, co I mean, I can just for a quick sec, because I'll touch on it about are there aliens, please go do your own research. I would invite everybody to sit and watch the International Space Station live feed for just a day and see how many crap and different things that happen there. I would invite people to get your own telescope and start watching the moon and the sun. You'll start seeing large craft just traveling over the face of the moon <laughs> super quick. There's no doubt that there's anomalies caught on camera. Um, by <laughs> Absolutely. Now, what, what's going on is there's a, uh, an, a, an intentional suppression of information. And it's gotten to the point where, just like on the TV show, there's good guys and bad guys. Just like in every society, there's good guys mm -hmm. and bad guys. And just like in every society, there's ones that are more powerful that whose job is actually to oversee sort of like how people interact with other people sort of like don't interact with those earthlings yet because they haven't quite, you know, got it, you know, or I'm, I'm kind of spinning off here. Let, let me, let me, let me refocus. Let me, let me bring it back to, I encourage people to, it, to really, really do your own research on, on see, on, I, on, on oh, that aliens have visited here on UFOs, that, the abductions. On that aliens have not only visited here, but have been here since the beginning of time okay. on this planet. That if, like, I got so, I get so locked onto something, like, let me just throw out uh, an example. I came into this lifetime with a memory of Mary Magdalene, okay, and being married to Christ and being a, 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 a royal woman and, and all this other stuff. Uh, whatever you want to call it, a memory of a life before or whatever. But I came in with a very distinct idea of who Mary Magdalene and Christ was. And it went starkly against what the Bible teaches and what religion teaches. Well, how, and, how did you know it was them, like, like you learned about them and then you what recognized in yourself or um, like, and I got adopted by a very Southern Baptist, very conservative, very, not who I would call spiritual, just very hateful people. And anybody but white people is lesser than, and anybody who isn't Christian is going to die and that they have the right to kill people over it. That's who I was adopted by. Right. Okay. So when they, I got into Sunday school and they started talking about Mary Magdalene was a whore. I stood up and I went, oh, how dare you call the bride of Christ a whore? She is a royal woman. And so is Christ. What are you talking about? This manger stuff. And he had no money. What are you people talking about? I got thrown out, out of Sunday school. I stuck so to my guns about this, this understanding that I felt like I had that in 2012, in February, 2012, I led 37 people through the South of France 
Where and did this understanding come from? Where did the understanding come from? It was just a knowledge of, under, of memory. A- Akashic records or like? Possibly my, my ability to, to uh, tap into the Akashic records and see things that have happened in history in this particular time. Be- maybe before I came down, obviously, to this body. But um, Are you so, saying you were Mary Magdalene or you no. knew? No, I just know of that information. Okay. Okay. All right. So I went so far as to, I found, when I was w- working with the Starseed Radio Hotline, we found uh, Kathleen McGowan, who had written bur- a book uh, called uh, The Expected One, and how this whole thing talks about Christ had a child, Christ and Mary Magdalene had a child, and her name is Sarah Temer, and Sarah Temer um, had visions like Christ did, and that Christ actually had a book that he wrote his own teachings in and his visions of the future and stuff like that. And that the, the Christian crusade. So I was like, let's go, let's go talk to the people. Okay. If this actually happened, let's go to France. Let's go to the South of France where these, where this happened that Mary Magdalene landed and raised her two children and spread the word of Christ. Mm -hmm. And let's go talk to them. I want to hear from them. And I was shocked. I was shocked and I was in awe and I was so happy <laughs> when you got to the f- south of France and heard from township after township, priest after priest. Mary Magdalene landed on these southern shores. She was married to Christ. She had two children by him. She had a book that the, Christ, that the church, the Christian church went after and created a, an entire war against the Cathars, which is the religion that came out of Christ's teaching. Um, it is just this extraordinary story. So I, I had to dive down into it and had to actually go there physically. So when I wanted to know about ancient aliens, I went to Egypt. So I led a hundred person tw- trip with Dr. Carmen Bolter to Egypt in 12, 12, 12. Um, we did a lot of extraordinary things and I was able to meet some extraordinary, very knowledgeable archeologists who will absolutely tell you, absolutely. We've broken into tombs. And even recently I've been going back and forth with messaging with my partner on the ground who still lives in Egypt and who is um, a doctor of astrophysics, astro. Anyway, she um, is, lives in Cairo um, 11 months out of the year and comes home for one month to keep her citizenship and she will absolutely tell you, uh, absolutely, there's all kinds of artifacts that, that have been found in, in, in these tombs and so on that get scooped up by the Smithsonian, get scooped up by our government, get scooped up and taken away that nobody gets to see. And I've seen enough of it. And I've traveled through the history of it. And I've had the conversations and I walked the path through Egypt. And I'm absolutely convinced that there were uh, extraterrestrial aliens, whatever you want to call it, that were here. And I'm absolutely convinced that they either helped or directed the building of not only the pyramids, but many other of the sacred sites. But you have to do a history. You have to go through, take the time and actually learn about history and walk it through. And the facts speak for themselves. Are there so any what, pictures of maybe some of these artifacts that the artifact itself did, you know, was swept up, but maybe somebody... Snap. I actually, yes, I've actually got a bunch of pictures. Uh, I, I'll send them to you and you're welcome to post them. And what they were, were they were sent to me in, um, they were supposed to, okay, so these particular pictures that I'm going to send to you are a bunch of tablets that were found in the Nazca area. Okay. And it was found in 2018, at the end of 2018, because I received the pictures at the beginning of 2019. Okay. And um, Dr. Erin Nell is her name, my, my partner on the ground, because I still do trips to Egypt as soon as we go again, because I love to take people there and show them. As soon as you see it with your own eyes, like, there's just no way I, I can't, you know, because I got to have the it for myself, too. So then I started asking questions like, why would they keep this from us? Why would they not tell us? And then I started thinking about security and the stupid like race wars for technology and and one nation against the other. And then. We run off in many different directions and then before you even know it. So I'd also like to, um, there are several different authors too that have put an extraordinary amount of their time and energy into writing books, educating people about this. Richard Dolan is one of them. I would highly suggest people to go out and read Richard Dolan's um, work. Um, He talks about why specifically dives into why the government now at this point is kind of being held over backwards and hostage by all these different things about why they won't come forward and say what's happening with the technologies and what we're actually doing. 
Um, when for, for the trips that you went on, um, you know, how did you get people to I, I get? Were you like leading the trip itself? Yes. Uh, so what? I would just say, anytime I've ever done anything, I've been blessed in that people want to come play with me. So I had my radio programs or whatever, and be like, people know you from from media or social media mm-hmm. or just from the radio program. I guess I would say mostly from. I started in 2009 on the Starseed Radio Hotline and was in radio solidly up until 2016. I had my own radio program. So I was on every week talking about different paranormal subjects, bringing people on that were experts, delving in, having it. It was always a talk radio program because I felt that people needed to be able to call in and interact with a guest because I felt like if you can ask questions, you're going to learn a lot faster. You're going to process that information Um, you're going to, you're going to move forward in your evolution a lot faster. And I wanted to bring forward everything from what's really going on with our birth certificates, the straw man account stuff, federal reserve, 911. Like I have delved into every topic trying to figure out why, why wouldn't they tell us this? Why, why are they holding this from us? Well, the problem is, is that there are higher ups, bigger ups. They've been out there running around the galaxy for long enough that they've gotten in a lot of trouble and then also attracted a lot of attention from the higher ups I was telling you about that are in charge of governing different solar systems, interactions between different races. And they don't like the fact that they're out there. There are humans out there from Earth doing things without the knowledge of people from Earth. And they've gotten to advance enough technology um, that they're now being put in pressure, under pressure from my understanding, uh, from the outside now. Uh, the whole government, the world governments have been for several years now and that they've been told that disclosure has to happen, that soon people aren't going to not be able to not know <laughs> with all the technology and everything. You know, just the average person has got can get a strong enough telescope to watch the moon and different things like that they've been talking about. Well, yeah, there's definitely more eyes of all types in the skies. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned that you think that abduction might become a topic that that is covered or released by the government. Where, where, where do you think that that's going? Because, you know, even though we've made such strides in the past what, three, three years, um, we're not quite there. You know, I mean, the general public might be a little more open minded to it because of the reporting. I don't know if if we have uh, an even 50% that believe truly that extraterrestrials, I mean, maybe, I don't know what the actual statistics are, but I feel like we have a ways to go. And then if all of a sudden you throw an abduction, um, they might just throw their hands up and go, this is just too much for me, you know? Not, well, the responsible reporting would start from the beginning, mm-hmm. you know, delving into the things that we've been talking about. Um going back in our history, seeing it with our own eyes, developing an, an opinion for ourselves, It'd be like, there's enough evidence here to continue to look at this a lot more closely. There's, let me just put it to you this way. There's enough evidence and there's been enough going on that our own government has written a bill demanding the release of the technology and the information around UFOs, UAPs, aliens, anything that has to do with our involvement with them going all the way back there's enough evidence that that it was taken seriously enough to be put in this last stimulus bill. So That's, if we find the evidence um, or if they release the evidence, let's say, then do you think that would open the, the gateway to having the conversation about abduction? If, if we're able to say, look at all this evidence, this is undeniable. Now next is this. <laughs> yeah. I think the first thing is that the getting the people who've been keeping the left hand knowing from what the right hand has been doing for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, getting those people to start letting go of some of this information to let go of that. Yes, we have space flight. Come on. We've, we've got spaceships out there. This is reverse technology and everything you see in the sky is from outside of our planet. (laughs) Think about half of it is ours and the UOPs that we're seeing up there. And I think the other half is not, we're being, we're under observation right now. This planet is under huge observation by not just one race, but by many. Yeah. And what's going on here right now, because this is unprecedented that we gain the ability for space travel without telling an entire planet that we gain an ability of state space travel. Why would we also have space force now? Come on. They've been spoon feeding us disclosure over the last couple of years. 
on television, if you guys no. listen to like the terminology, it's yeah. psychological. But, what but, about alien tape? Well, Sarah, Alienware. <laughs> well, Sarah, the thing that bothers me so much is like, and you know, I, I, pro- I promised earlier that I wouldn't get into politics because, and I won't. I promised you all for a long time. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, people were going after Trump about the space force and laughing about it. And I'm, and I'm like, this makes sense. Like, you know, it, we are expanding as a culture, as a, as a civilization. Um, it, it, it's the natural progression of, of, I think if it's, even if it's just a military unit, it, it does kind of make sense. Um, and then of course there's this, this other aspect that you and I talk about, which is an alien presence. And, and if that's the case, of course we don't want to be more war mongers, but don't we have the, the responsibility, um, you know, to have a, a unit that can that can deal with those matters. Absolutely. We've had a unit to be able to deal with those matters since 1947. Oh, so there's a space force. And this is just a label now kind of slapped onto that and they're they're merging them or, or what? I believe so. Now, for some reason, the Navy's been in charge of all of this stuff for so long. Um there's so much research, my goodness, please dive into it if you all want to get the evidence, because there's from the symbology that the sports space force is used to um, if you just start looking at the patches of all the different military. Uh, 2021 is going to be the year of the whistleblower. You guys have no idea who's about to come out onto the scene and start talking about stuff's going on in the, on the inside. Us uh, abductees. And the ones that have been out here kind of putting our necks out, out and risking being laughed off the planet mm-hmm. and laughed out of any kind of job, laughed out of being taken seriously at all, are the ones experiencing all this first. We're sort of like the first liners here. And we're trying to tell you guys something's going on here. And then when it all comes out, you know what I mean? It, 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 and it's coming this year. I'm telling you right now, there are going to be some higher ups in the military, in government, and they have. They've already been filmed and they're about to be put out on several different documentaries that are coming out. <laughs> okay. They've well, already, I'm telling you, it's already done. Yeah. I, I saw Christopher Bledsoe on Universal Secrets on KGRA and he, he was saying that he thinks 2021 is, 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 is going to be a, a more um, outrageous year, <laughs> I guess. Than, yeah. Than- when you get the officials that are coming forward that are actually saying, this is who I am. This is my rank. This is who I was in the military and the government. And this is what I did. I mean, they're starting to come out more and more and more, but they're going on official record. Some on their Beth dead, some not others coming forward saying, we've got to stop this because there's basically, if you can imagine, it's not even the military running this. It's its own special interest, business, money, power, hungry people out there running an interstellar, commercially driven mining operation and dealing with other uh, uh, civilizations without our knowledge and keeping all that money and all that power and all that to themselves. We have had the ability to replace limbs and to make things and to heal people for Mm -hmm. many, many, many years now, going back to the like eighties. Okay. And other people have come forward, not just Randy Kramer, not just, um, Corey good but this year some real serious people are going to be stepping forward and saying this is who i am yeah. this is what i did we've been on mars forever we got kicked off the moon because we're not supposed to be there because there's a bunch of other races on the back side okay and the moon by the way is 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 but here's the thing that don't we have imagery now i mean don't we have satellites and, and including us and china that we've seen the backside of the moon and there there doesn't seem to be I would love to send you pictures of the backside of the moon that I have that there, it's completely lit up by cities. It's complete. It's so overgrown now on the backside that you can take your own amateur high powered telescope. And at the right times of the year, you can actually see the dark side a little bit and actually see the line of the lights from the cities back there. I, I would love Alan to send you all these pictures and stuff like that, that I've, that I've gotten uh, from people over the years and sure. different yeah. alphabet <laughs> agencies and stuff with regard to uh, with regard to this information we weren't allowed to go back to the moon that's why we didn't go back it kind of it kind of makes sense you know the whole the whole idea that i mean I, I don't know what makes more sense but the idea that the public just got tired of funding it um but we still had a space program um we still had a shuttle missions so it was not like the public was totally dried up on the idea of us exploring space um couldn't we have figured out a way, you know, years ago to, to do that again? And instead, 
now we've left it to the privatization. The question then, Sarah, is do you think that these private companies are in cahoots with the government or is the government going, oh, my gosh, we have to deal with these people now? The government's going, oh, my gosh, we have to deal with these people now because they're the, they are the breakaway society, society that I referenced earlier. And um, Michael, what is his name? And he has spent his whole life talk about the break, breakaway societies. Uh, but definitely Richard Dolan also goes into extreme detail, backing it up with a lot of references and facts and so on. But there is a there is I mean, the fact that doesn't matter who he was and we won't talk politics, but demanded to have information with regard to what Area 51 through Area 56 has with regard to aliens and alien technology and was turned away mm -hmm. and literally showed up at the door and was turned away. He wasn't the first president that happened to. There is a breakaway society of privatized citizens with way too much in power out there running around putting us all at risk. And it's time now for them. And then I asked myself, well, chase the money. Or I asked myself why. And my response over the years going through it myself and looking at all of the evidence is chase the money. They want to keep us sick so they keep us buying. Well, that, that's a little bit of population control right now, but dumb and sick. Uh, uh, food, our food, our water is poison. Um, we're get we're sick. <laughs> Our mental health is sick. We're in division in this country, and it's and it's there's so much more. And why would why in the big scheme of things, if you have got these people that are sort of like, well, this mentality of they're going to be my worker bees down there on the planet. We're just going to utilize everything we possibly can of this planet and use it up. We don't care because we've got space travel. We go to a different planet because they know there's a bunch of other planets out there. They know that they, they don't have to stay here. They can just use this up like a use rag and throw it away. And I'm talking about the planet. I'm talking about the people on the planet and, and, and just look around. <laughs> so I, am, I am being overwhelmed in, in messages and chats uh, to get pictures. Do you, do you have anything that you can send tonight? That we can Absolutely. Later on. Uh, okay. Do you know if I go into my pictures on this thing? It's probably going to uh, cut me out of here. No, you my can, only. Yeah, you know, maybe during the um the break, if you can um just sure. send me some pictures, and then I'll I'll get them uploaded. Absolutely. This the one from the Nazca lines. I used to have the coordinates, and I can go, probably go back and find them, of where this cave was, where they went in and, at the end of 2018, and they supposedly found. A just alive, not a Zeta, because it was blue. It was a little bit, it's almost like the big headed guys or the big eyes and stuff, but they have, it had, this particular being had a blue tint to them. And gray, was I. With a blue tint? Gray with a more of a blue, indigo blue tint okay. to it. So it was different than the Zetas. It was a different kind, but supposed like like I had video and everything of it raising its hand up and everything like that with the light when they came in there. And so um, I'll absolutely send you all of that. So those are the so the the that'll be that'll be plaques that I'll be sending with all kinds of alien artifact drawings on it in this in this cave. And I'll send all that, and then I'll send you pictures of the moon. The back, the, the side of the moon, right where they're catching the light. Yeah, and okay. then um, the right on now. the side tip, I will send you a couple of pictures um, when I've been taken up by benevolent beings into spacecraft, and we've traveled around a little bit. So I was I was allowed to take a snap a couple of uh, fit photos. So I'll, I so can Sarah, send those. Let me go to our first break right at the line here. Um, so if you get a chance during this break to go ahead and do that, that'd be awesome. Um, Perfect. If you need more time, please uh, let us know. This is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now on KGRA Radio. Thank you all for hanging with me tonight. And yeah, once in a while, I got to tell you how I feel. Um, but don't worry, it's not going to become a regular thing. All right, this is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now. We will be right back on the flip side. And you are the sky I need to swim free And you, you need to fly I live for daylight You live for the night You love to wander And I want to be right But the, the sweetness in me Needs love Better in you 
mainstream media's most wanted. KGRARadio.com. I've been going on and I don't want to be found Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now, live on KGRA Radio. If you want to find out more about the new website, kgradb.com. And in the last 30 minutes tonight, we'll open up the phone lines. The Power Normal Radio app phone line number is 855-472-5483. Um, yeah, we're covering a lot more than I, I thought we will tonight. So we're going to get back to the um, abduction side of the story uh, when Sierra returns. So she is trying to get us some images right now as we speak, um, because <laughs> so many of you lovingly demanded uh, to see images, and rightly so, because, um, you know, as she said, you know, we have to go by evidence, and I say it all the time. Um, it's great to have ideas and theories, but evidence matters. Uh, what do you think, Bill? Agreed. Do you know uh, exactly what type of images <laughs> she's going to be sending you? Um, apparently, images of the dark side of the moon, and there are structures and lights there, um, as well as artifacts found in Egypt to support ancient alien visitation. It's going to be interesting to see where the source of um, this material came from. It okay. is. And I, I saw Mar Marco think he's expecting blurry images. We'll see, Marco. We will see in just a bit. Um, but, you know, that is the case, unfortunately. Um, you know, uh, you know, I was looking at that image that Christopher Bledsoe so shared on Universal Secrets, and it was cool. You could see the shape of a of a figure, right? And they, when they're in the woods, but it, you know, it's it's not enough to to prove, right, to anybody that that was some sort of shadow creature or alien or what have you. Um, and I don't I don't know how you can convince anyone, you know, not like us who entertain these ideas um, without really clear Chris images. That's the thing. It's great to have an open mind, but you also have to be objective and try to reach like our friend Mark D'Antonio when he's doing the photo video uh, analysis of anything that comes toward to MUFON. Mm -hmm. It's important to go over all the possible logical, rational explanations of anything that somebody submits. Now, yes, there is a small percentage, a small percentage of things that just can't be explained away. With a rational conclusion, because it's inconclusive based on the footage to really determine what you're seeing. And that's why I'm careful. And we've mentioned this before in the past. When you, when you get all this material and all this data, it could be a, a, a camera anom anomaly. Yeah, you know? Yes. Um, and I think that's the easiest explanation for most of these especially when it's a shaky camera, then the anomaly is just the blurred images of a light moving around. Um, I know Charles and I were, you know, going back and forth um, recently, very briefly about that UFO blue UFO in Hawaii. Uh, it, you know, it's fascinating when people, he you hear the report that people were chasing this thing in a car and it seemed to be moving at a, at a high clip. Um, but, you know, when you look at the video footage that on the iPhone or whatever phone it was, it's, you know, it could have been a cellophane balloon or, uh, it could have been, you know, a, a glider of some sort. Uh, That's exactly. Actually, on another show that airs on KJRA, Martin Willis mm -hmm. provided a photo by, by Alejandro Rojas. And it showed a bluish neon blue hand glider. Wait, the and, same same thing, same night? or? Well, no, I'm just saying oh. there there is a hand glider that someone uses in that area. And it looks very similar to what we're seeing. Now, the only thing is... Was this hand glider just going to just drop into the ocean? You know what I mean? He had to have a landing spot, so this thing went into the water. Supposedly. And there was no sound either. Exactly. Well, you know, if you're way up, if you're far from an object, it's hard to see a sound. Even like when a plane is in the distance or a helicopter, it takes a while before that sound reaches your point. Mm -hmm. but with the hand glider, it's obviously making a lot less noise. So, yep. but um, I am hearing that there's going to be, and you, you're in the loop. 
Yeah. I'm hearing there might be some interesting information coming out this week. I, that's all I can say. Okay. So I'll say this. James Fox, when he was on the program, yeah. did, did that in December, some news would come out. And then we got, um, uh, what was in the Haim, Haim Hashem, Ashed? I can't remember. The, oh, the, Israeli. the Israeli? Yeah. Um, it, it, about this, you know, Galactic Federation um, the, from inside information from years of working um, in defense. And so, was that what he meant? I don't. I don't know. Um, did he even know exactly what was going to drop, or did he just know something was going to drop? And and if that was it, that was interesting, but it, it didn't really catch. Well, I think if anyone is in the loop with the context and the people that he knows, James Fox is, I would think, privy on a lot of information that is out there and that's coming. And he mentioned something uh, stuff to us off the air that we can't repeat. But you can tell that he believes that 2021, but we hear this all the time. Yeah, yeah. But he says that 2021 is going to be an interesting year of information coming out. Okay, so what does he mean by interesting, though? Are we talking about just ufology or other things? No, well, you got to remember, what's his specific area of interest and what he's been doing documentaries on for the past few decades? It's mm-hmm. been based on ufology. True. So I'm thinking maybe there's a video that's going to drop because I'm hearing February. You, and I don't know what you've heard, but she's coming back now. But it's going to be interesting, uh, Alan, to see what information is coming out and how important it is. Is it going to be a game changer Is this going to be the one? I highly doubt it because we hear this all the time. But anyway, back to your guest, Sierra. Have a great one. All right. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. We're back with Sierra. And uh, I do want to add that next week, Stephen Bassett will be joining me on the program. Uh, Great. And, you know, a couple of years ago, 2018, he made a prediction about um, some of our exopolitics here on Earth. partially kind of sort of came true so we'll talk more about that with him and and it does seem sierra uh, bill and i were just talking that something is going to be released something big this year it's been like this kind of slow build up and i've never i've never been in the disclosure is happening soon camp but i don't know uh, i'm starting to get there now it, it seems <laughs> like there's this this riptide and um nothing seems to be slowing it down um, yeah, yeah. Did you receive those pictures? I'm I'm looking right now. Awesome. Yep. So we'll get those up a little bit later, guys. Once I have a chance to download the pictures and, and upload them. Uh, so, Sierra, can you tell us about you know your personal experience more? Because you know you said that at the time it was your girlfriend. Um, I think didn't believe right that you were abducted. Uh, well, she, it's interesting because when I first got together with her, she talked about the grays, the Zetas, this, and the U, the government and how they're, you know, covering up this whole thing. And I was like, well, I can see ghosts and angels. So why not aliens? Right? Like I'm not, I don't, you know, I had no opinion of them one way or the other, other. I just knew that I was on a quest to figure out more about myself and my own abilities and how to handle all of that in, in a society who absolutely has been closed minded to it, but it's a lot better about it now. Um, but, uh, so, but, but, you know, she, you know, because of your relationship, she's thinking it must be a lack of trust. So if she has an open mind to, you know, alien encounters, experiencers, but then she's saying, well, how could you have possibly been pregnant? Then exactly. Lack of trust that becomes the issue here. Right. And then and doesn't that undermine your story? It, it's interesting because, I don't think it undermines it. I think it speaks to people's fragility, uh, human beings, and they're they're under their when when their paradigm is doesn't include something like that. Um, even though she knew and was convinced there was these things called Zetas that crashed, and the government's been working that they've been working with the government, she couldn't understand why back then why I was pregnant. Like, what does that have to do with anything? You know what I mean? Um, and even after I sourced some some help from a women's group a psychic women's group that i was attending about there was a woman there that knew about the crash of wild wall and that there was the zeta reticuli hybridization program and i was completely dumbfounded i was like you're kidding me they could just take me against my will that doesn't make any sense to me but ultimately when i was pregnant and started showing being pregnant my girlfriend 
plus we just weren't a really good match. Um, there was a lot of PTSD issues and stuff like that. And, and, uh, as she was a person, ultimately I didn't need to be in a relationship with, but we ended up breaking up. I ended up sort of going on the run a little bit because from my women's group, I was a part of a women's psychic group in Manitou Springs. We all got together and was like, okay, so now I'm pregnant. How does that work? And how does that happen? And we all like had a big powwow, like, what should we do? And what's happened historically in the past. And this woman who seemed to know a lot about it said that, well, historically women don't wake up in the middle of this process. <laughs> and historically they don't nab lesbians who haven't been sleeping with men that didn't think that, that didn't, you know, oops, and I might be pregnant kind of a thing. So in, in some regard, uh, I guess my story is a bit unique in that way in that I was not sleeping with men, had not been sleeping with men. <laughs> um, and I was pregnant. And that was, that was the bottom of it. And so we decided that, well, they started talking then about soul contracts. And I said, well, I want to break this contract. And they said, and how, and then be specific. And I said, I want to keep the baby. I want to hold on to the baby. They can't just do this and take the baby away. Yeah. Um, so I, we started doing, we put in plan this, in, in motion, this plan that s- seemed kind of crazy at the time, but I was willing just about do anything because I was in the middle of this experience, didn't know what to do. I just started sleeping on the different women's couches, going from place to place and not ever letting myself be tracked where I was going, got really kind of paranoid a little bit. And just because I didn't want them to come back and take the baby. And so how far, down is how, how far along I ended up get to at least four, four and a half months along, um, that I knew of, uh, pregnant. And then we started talking about my girlfriend and I had a big blow up. She's like, yeah, this is a real baby. You need to go to a doctor. You need to get vitamins. And I'm like, I'm being taken care of by the women. They're telling me all the different things to do. They've had babies before. I'm taking prenatal. I'm doing, she's like, no, you need to go to a doctor and have an ultrasound. You need to go, you know, so I brought it to the sticking with you up to this point. I'm sorry. She was, she was sticking with you up until this point then thinking or sticking, sticking with me. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, we, yeah. Uh, in the end, I just think it was hard for her and we ended up breaking up. Um, I, uh, don't know. I mean, she, here's the thing I had her, she passed away of cancer in 2016 and I got her on film before she died about four months before she died. She knew she had stage four cancer and I got her giving her own testimony and she laughed and stuff about it and actually said on the testimony that I gave to J3 films who did the uh, extraordinary, the seating, uh, her testimony of her laughing and saying, yeah, I guess I believed in UFOs, but it was hard for me my, at that time to wrap my head around the fact that my girlfriend was pregnant, <laughs> you know, I mean, she talked about it later on. Like, I guess that was really kind of a two faced thing. I believe in, in aliens, but then you say that you're pregnant and we had that whole experience of them coming that night. And, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's just, she just, <laughs> but this, isn't that a testament to how all of us um, deal with this? And, and again, back to the public, you know, it's a lot to ask. It's a lot to ask for people to, to believe. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is. It's a lot for me to believe and to, and to react to and deal with in my life. Right. It was something I, did, I wanted to just forget about. After the whole thing happened, and I basically, just to bring people along who haven't seen Extraordinary the Seating, I woke up one morning and, and my stomach was completely flat and the baby was gone. Uh, no afterbirth, no accidental, like, you know, no nothing. You know, usually if you have a baby and it, and it dies, you pass a placenta, you pass a material. None of that ever happened. And, um, I, it upset me so badly that I got mad at everybody. Like I, even my women's group, and I thought that maybe they had psychosomatically convinced me that I was pregnant, that they were the one they were in on it somehow. I got so upset. Like our mind will go to extraordinary lengths to not accept something that challenges the paradigm, the structure of how the brain is designed. It's how human yeah, beings are made. Even even if that were true, then, then they would be talking about a virgin birth. Because, because <laughs> you know that? And then you're thinking, well, what's, what's more believable or not believable at that point, right? Well, you know, somebody else in history talked about having a virgin birth and a light being in the sky before his birth. And we can get into that whole thing, too, if you want, but... Anyway, is that, is that where you land? Do you think that that was ancient astronaut intervention? 
Absolutely. I believe that Christ is hybrid, was a hybrid. Absolutely. It was, it was either angelic intervention of some sort of other type of being that he was also besides human. But, uh, oh yeah, that's all through the Bible. I became an Episcopalian minister because I got so challenged about a lot of things. I'm a very deeply spiritual person, have a deep faith base. Okay. Um, I have a very powerful, uh, relationship with who I believe God is and where I am in all of that. But I didn't for a long time because I was raised in a household who told me I was going to hell because I'm a lesbian and that my love is damned. And that, that didn't sit well for me. So I went into theology and studied and became an Episcopalian minister. I do not take a congregation. I just did it so that I could come to this, these, these explanations myself of why and even through every written and verbal account of history in the Bible or otherwise, and through history, people have been talking about angels and other beings visiting us from we don't know where forever, even in our own religions, even in our own religious um, teachings. Right, but we are it, in the age of, of science, right? So like, did you, you were able to confirm that you had this child? Was I able to? Nope. Not through any kind of technological, nope, no kind of testing tests. There was nothing to, there was no placenta to test afterwards when I was no longer pregnant. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then um, I started calling around asking people in my, I was a reservist at the time, an army reservist, and calling men and people and blaming them because at first I was in shock and then I got super angry and had probably had a lot of hormonal type of thing to go with it too postpartum depression. I started making a lot of waves around NORAD and around the people that I know in my unit and so on. And it wasn't too long before I, uh, Gina and I had already broken up my ex-girlfriend. Um, the place that this all happened was an apartment complex in Colorado Springs. I had left and was bouncing around on women's couches, trying to avoid having the baby taken. And we had already broken up. The baby was already gone. Mm -hmm. And we had had a conversation about me coming and getting the rest of my stuff at the apartment. And she was leaving the apartment and had bought a house and was moving into that house. And so I came by one day, we had made arrangements that during the day when she wasn't there for me to come by and get the rest of my stuff. And I drove up and there was a black Ford R sedan, two men in black standing there when I came to get my stuff that day. Um, and I was taken into NORAD for about eight hours and shown a lot of different kinds of technologies. Mm -hmm. So you were taken directly to NORAD? Directly into NORAD. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was with, with mm -hmm. your eyes wide open or did they, you know, cover you <laughs> and, and then reveal where you were or how, how does that work? So when I got, when I got out of the vehicle, I was so upset and it's sort of like, I knew they were there for me. I was like, it's about time I got somebody's attention. I slammed the door I got out of and I walked up to them and they were just like, you know, and they motioned for me and I got, and I came around and I got, they opened up the door behind the driver and I got in there and I'm just like, you know, it's taken so long for all of this to come through. Uh, like, why aren't you guys paying attention to me? I mean, it's about time that somebody got, that I, I got somebody's attention and I'm just yammering. And before I know it, they're in the vehicle, we're backing up and we're starting to drive. And I was like, wait a minute, what did I just do? I just got in the car with people. I don't know. So um, I started to get kind of an adrenaline rush. And I was like, hey, you guys, where are we going? Like, you have yet to say something to me. Who are you and what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And I started then, look, I looked down and I saw no way to open the door, the back door. There was no handle. There was no locky thing. And there was no re remote thing to get the door up and down. <clears throat> so I had an immediate rush of adrenaline. I got large doses of adrenaline when I'm from, I was a kid and I get really strong. And then I channeled all that into martial arts and the military and stuff like that. And immediately I started to do risk assessment and I was going to choke out the driver with his seatbelt and smash out the back window and get out is what my immediate next move was about to be. And I started to lean forward to grab a hold of that driver. And the next thing I know is it's approximately 15 to 20 minutes later, and I come to just looking, staring straight forward, no adrenaline running, no nothing. And normally when I get my adrenaline going, it's, you know, that whole huff, huff, and I got to walk it off and, you know, well, I mean, calm I... myself down for a minute. 
Yeah. And, and I don't mean to lessen what you're talking about here, but you know, back when I used to work in restaurants um, or bartending, my adrenaline would be high by the end of the night. It would take hours to calm down, to calm down. Yeah. That, that's not even a life threatening situation. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And so I came to sort of staring ahead and I was like, what? just happened. And the reason why I know is about 15, 20 minutes down the road is because I knew Manitou in, in Colorado Springs really well. And we had gone up 24 in the back and uh, north western side of NORAD. Okay. So we had driven away, for, uh, away from where I was back on the, there's Highway 24 that, my, Cheyenne Mountain. And then there's, then there's another mountain. There's one road that runs through there. It's Highway 24. So it goes towards the backside of NORAD. And on the, just to the northwestern side, there was a road we were starting to drive down towards the uh, drive up, I should say, because you go up into the mountain and, and drive in. So basically we were going into NORAD, but from the back, not from the front where everybody sees the sure. entrance. So um, I came to, and I, and I thought to myself, oh, what just happened? Why is my adrenaline not running? And I looked at the guy in front of me and I was like, okay, well, they don't know I'm psychic. So I'm going to just go into his head and, and get any impression I might get, you know, cause sometimes it would come through with an emotion, uh, a word, a sentence, a f- you just, just any time that I try to tap in to somebody. And I try not to do that because I'm an empath also. And I spend a lot, a great deal of my life trying to keep energy, people's energy out, mm-hmm. not trying to willingly go in. And so, um, in fact, that's what the women were tre- teaching me is how to shield myself and not let everything completely overwhelm me all the time with my abilities. And so, um, I was like, okay, I'll just go into the driver's head. And I went, I just focused and I, all I could hear is the grass is green and the sky is blue. <laughs> what? Over and over and over and over again. The grass is green. The sky is blue. The grass is green. The sky is, blue. what is that? And I come to find out later on, it's actually a defense against a um, telepath so that <laughs> you can train yourself. You as a de- knew you were, you, you could tap into their minds. Exactly. So he just kept going, grass is green, the sky is blue. What is that? So I look over at the passenger and I start to lean over and I'm looking at him like, does that guy have an ear? Because they have hats on, uh, like a fedora almost like, a little bit wider brim, brim than a fedora. And it was pulled down and I didn't see any hair and I barely saw a little hole for a ear. What the? And I, so I was like, hmm. So I closed my eyes and I sat back and I started to project into his thoughts. And immediately there was this sharp pain in my head. And I like pulled back. What in the world? What was that? I felt like I got electrocuted. Like there was an actual physical repercussion on my end from trying to go into that person's head. I don't think it was a person. It was the most powerful tele- telepath. Like a reverberation back to you? Yes. So okay. I was told a long time ago that being an empath, if you develop your being an empath, being able to pick up people's sensations of feelings and different things like that, that you could turn it into a weapon and actually cause physical sensation in other people's bodies. And that's what I had just experienced from this. I went in trying to figure out what's going on and I get a physical shock in my brain that caused a headache. And I just sat back like, oh, my God, what the hell, you know? Yeah. And then I was starting to get scared. <laughs> what is going on here? Where am I? So uh, you're starting to get scared. I would have been scared from <laughs> for moment one. I was. And that's when the adrenaline went and then the whole thing and me came out of it. And now I'm just in a, OK, I'm going into threat assessment and obser- observation mode now. So you're trained in the military in different types of situations to observe. And then I go into this place where I switch my brain to complete observation where I'm memorizing absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. And that's what I started doing. So I just stopped communicating with them because in the entire eight hours I was there, they never said a word to me, those men in black, not a one. So you're you're making a record in your head. I'm making a record in my head. I'm watching as we drive up what it looks like. I'm watching as we're driving into the tunnel and as we pull off to the right and we park and how there's a parking area through. I'm watching how then you go to an area where you go through a bunch of different guards. I'm looking at because I was um, a carpenter 
uh, as an engineer, a combat engineer in the military, I know buildings. I know, I, I see things, I understand structure. And so I memorize, I just start absorbing every step through that place going in and and when we came up to where we were supposed to check in at the the people the military personnel looked terrified when we walked up and they saw who I was with they basically just moved out of the way in any military installation i have ever been in especially something as highly guarded as Cheyenne Mountain you stop you give your information they take a picture of your id they get you, they in fact you got to be on a list we drove in there and everybody scrambled out of their way when I was with these two men sure, and they looked absolutely terrified of these people and me when we walked in. So we get out of the vehicle when we park and they flank me on either side, the one with the ability on my right and the one human guy on the left. And they get kind of just right behind me, right in my peripheral, just right in front of me. And as they walk, I'm walking. So they're sort of like, I have this feeling of sort of being dragged along, just walk. So walk, we go. And we go into an area, we go through concrete that's been formed and conduit running down the sides and the tops of the ceiling with bulbs that are in cages, okay? Until we go get on an elevator and we go down and I don't know how fast the elevator is counting, but I'm coming up in the counting one, two, three, four, how fast? As far we went down, I reached 45 count before we reached where, where we came out. Wow. And then we went through it past another section, another check-in section of the guy. The guy actually almost fell over backwards when he saw us come out of the elevator. He just stood up and stood back out of the way. And we walked right through and then walked down, I'd say probably 100 yards or so, got on another elevator, and from the direction... I would say I, we were walking in the mountain directly west. And we walked about 100 yards, got another elevator, and went down a 25 count and then out. Okay. From what I could sense, we were way down on the back side and down several la- levels down on the back side of NORAD. We came into um, what looked like. Uh, it's still the, the poured concrete, still the conduiting, but the conduiting instead of just the balls with the cages started to become flat, um, um, oh, the stupid light bulb things, you know, the flat fluorescent lights in the, in the flat. Okay. Yeah. So it turned into that. And then as we, we walked, we went through another couple. Of, it was like these blast doors. It was like these crazy huge blast doors. Another cu- couple of checkpoints we didn't have to stop at. Mm-hmm. Walked right through there and then walked upstairs and into a room of which we wa- they walked me right up to what looked like just this big glass. Yeah. And they walked up and then they turned out a face away from the glass. And so I walked up to the middle of the glass and I just looked like, <laughs> what is this? Um, were you just curious? Yeah, well, I but they were bringing me there. Like, I mean, they walked right up to the glass. So I walked up and I looked down. And I was um, seven stories in the seven stories high, about six or seven stories down, and about I would consider it. Uh, What I could see and what was lit in front of me was the size of about 10 football fields. Um, And out there was all manner of different kinds of aircraft. All is like a storage place for aircraft, new new aircraft, old aircraft. Um, They were all just parked in there. All with different military markings from Air Force, Navy, Army. It, I saw all the different, uh, insignia uh, you know military marking and i stood there for a while because i was trying to figure out what in the world we were doing there i looked at left and right and they're just standing there mm-hmm. and and i'm looking down and and about one football about 75 yards out and about 11 o'clock i looked down and there was a round craft absolutely round absolutely like the typical uap 
Okay, so like 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 a a tic tac or like a UFO, like uh, a circular uh, disc. Okay, a, a circular. Sorry, I just had surgery on my right arm. I can't really raise it up right very well. Circular disc. By with the way, a little bit. Very curious about your tattoos as well. Oh, <laughs> um, I it it and on the top of it, it had um, Air Force markings and a uh, number across the top. And so I looked at it and I was like, holy God. But the, the direction is, that I was look, observing it from was above. So I couldn't see if it was sitting on a platform, if it was sitting on landing gear, or if it was just hovering there. I have no idea. It was there, though, amongst all this other craft, including some watercraft in there, too, now that I think about it. Um, but you think about it, so what? It, it's just something that you've seen later that re- reminded you of what you saw? Each time, so one of the things that I get, got developed in as I was writing my autobiography is um, going back and looking and observing at um, memories from a different place where you're not looking through. It's like almost a remote viewing Mm -hmm. of the past events because we as human beings observe and we take in from any information only from where we are, our, our, our ability to perceive, perceive things is at that moment. Okay. So if I can, as I astro project back and I observe myself doing these things, I can get more information. So through doing that and going back and writing the book and continuing to dig and pull up memories and pull out memories, they try to keep me from remembering because for a very long time, I didn't remember any of this either. <laughs> So, I, so yeah, where, so where does this lead you to? What, what, what happens here? They, I see, I see that there's aircraft there that I, I, I went, Oh my God, do you see that? And I really wish I hadn't have done that because they started to walk away and I'm getting pulled away with them mm-hmm. as they walk away and then down more hallways. Um, we did a lot more walking this time and the building started to, to change. It started to change from, uh, the, the poured concrete in the dome to uh, drywall, okay, and doors and office, like an office-like setting, uh, okay. ceilings with the drop ceiling, you know, um, as we walk through here. And then we started to approach a particular area where we walked down a hallway, and then the hallway went out like this and around and kept we walked down the hallway and there was a gentleman waiting for us at the end of this hallway there was a door but it was sort of like there was a room and and the hallway went around this room okay Okay. and then you could continue forward they were bringing me to this room there was a man in a science coat white coat little off (laughs) pocket protector thing it comes in handy later or it comes in later on had all this stuff he's just yeah total geeked out total absolute scientist really high strung. I think he'd probably had about a hundred cups of coffee. Um, just, I don't know if he was just super nervous mm-hmm. with who I was with or what. But he's like, okay, that's, I, 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 I want to show you this stuff. Come on in here. I, I can't believe I got the clearance to show this to you. Blah, blah, blah. We've been working on this for a long time. I'm really, really excited. He was just going on with all of this on and on and on. I had no idea what he's talking about. He opened the door and we walked inside the room. Um, both of the men in black stayed outside of that room but inside of the room there was an observation area of a room inside of that room okay and the observation area had a whole bunch of control panels computers and different things like that and they look through glass and one doorway to go in one to come out in that room there was a whole bunch of lab equipment and a whole bunch of other different things i didn't i didn't recognize um and he came in he was super excited he says, I, I'm one of, they told me that I could share this with you. He picks up a Pepsi can off of his desk. He takes it in the room. He motions for me to follow him inside this room. Uh, he goes in. He There's this machine there. It's about the size of a large Keurig when they first came out. <laughs> and there it had this plexiglass that kind of slid up and down on the front. Okay. He went over there and he there's all kinds of things, just wires no tubes or anything like that, but just wires attached to this box. And he lifted up that thing. He put the, the Pepsi can in there. He slid it, slid it back down. He could, he motioned me to come out 
he shut the door to the inside room. We were sitting on in the room and observing through the glass. And then he started talking about this technology, how excited it, how exciting it is. And he's pressing all these buttons and I'm looking at him and then he looks up and he points that, but he points to the other side of the room. So I look over there and I look back and there's no Pepsi can there. And I look over there and there's a Pepsi can. And the very first thing I said was bullshit. No way. And he was like, come with me. So we go inside. He he pull, he pulls up the thing. He grabs a Pepsi can out. He scratches it on the bottom right with a. He, t- he takes out like this metal thing. He scratches the bottom right of the Pepsi can. Goes yeah. back over to where it was in the beginning. Places it in there. We come back out. We shut the door. But he's pointing this time. Don't take your eyes off of that. And he starts doing the controls and stuff like that. And then I kid you not, it dematerialized. And he points back over to the other side. So my head goes over there and it starts to rematerialize. And I screamed bullshit this time because, I mean, (laughs) your mind is like, (laughs) what just happened? It it was the it was the continuing breaking of my paradigm. It's like your mind fights so incredibly hard to tell you that just didn't happen. That that you're being checked. You're being like pranked. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, where's the camera? (laughs) <laughs> I'm, be- I'm being pranked i just know it so, much so he sounds like star wars it sounds like star trek right um absolutely but this is reality uh, i this is my reality i experienced this and all i can do is report on what i experienced but it was it was shocking it it, it upset me it gave me kind of a headache even it's like my mind so badly didn't couldn't wrap it and I, here I am, a lover of Star Trek and Star Wars and everything that is, you know, paranormal. And but when you're faced with it, your mind will do everything it possibly can to not accept it. it. I see it all the time with regard to the paranormal. I literally stood there and looked up and had a UOP, a Tic Tac, right above me, and I had five people standing with me, and three of them couldn't see it. So, Sierra, let's let's finish this story because I do want yes. to show the the images. Um, so yes, perfect. Um, so what? then we, um, he, I went in there, he pulled out the, the Pepsi can. There was a scratch in the bottom, right? Mm-hmm. You know, even the, like the little bit of paint rolled up and everything like that. It was the same can. And I was like, then I was like, where did you get this? Where did we get this kind of technology? And from how long have we had it? And he was facing me looking back out through the window, the, the door, to the interior, the room that we were just in. And then he started to speak and it sounded like somebody cut him off. He started to say, well, back in, and he looked up and his eyes got really big and terrorized. Like, and I looked him behind me and there was that one man in black that was messing with me in the car. And then here I get pulled away with him and off we go. Like the guy was in the middle of it telling me where they got the technology and couldn't speak any longer. So down more hallways, into more areas, we started to, I started to go a little bit numb at this point. <laughs> mm-hmm. I started to be a little bit like, what's happening here? I don't, under, I don't, I don't, I don't understand this. Why yeah. am I being shown all of this stuff? Why? What, it, what in the world, what in the world is happening? And so then we go into a completely different area. We end up traveling in a couple more elevators going up and over and down and to a completely different area, which what I would call South Southern part of Cheyenne mountain towards the backs, towards the back of it and down further. And at the deepest that we had gone, um, I got caught on that one, not counting as we were going down because I was caught in my own thought of what am I doing here? And so um, we go into this other section, this other area and we, we start to walk through and I start to get the sense of like a hospital or a, that kind of like experimental lab type of thing. And I didn't like it. I didn't like where we were. I didn't like the feeling of it. I started to become very concerned, um, just prickly on the, my back, like this is not right. They bring me into a room that had an observation glass. And inside of that room was a table laying on that table with a glass over the top of it was a six foot tall gray. Now the one I saw was like one of the two and a half, three foot tall ones when it happened to me. When, let, when you were abducted. When I was abducted. Okay. But when I was, when, but this thing was tall, like six feet long at least uh, is, on this. Yeah. Um, and 
I looked at them and at this time I was almost exhausted. So we're like, what now? And I thought, okay, they're now trying to trick me. They're trying to show me there's literally laying in front of me a dead alien and I couldn't accept it. This is a, this is a, this is a doll. This is a, this is a, they're trying to trick me. Are they trying to convince me of something? What is, what is happening? All these things running through my head. So I thought, all right, fine. They don't, well, maybe they know. I don't know. I was like, I'm going to go in telepathically and see if this is a real thing or not. The only problem with doing that is that with my particular ability, I can't speak to anybody else's, but I did work with Colorado Search and Rescue up in Summit County for many years, cadaver recovering. I could track when they had people they couldn't find. They'd gone into the, gone back into the wilderness and wasn't able to come out. Mm -hmm. Uh, They would come and get me and I would track their body. And how I could do that is by tapping into their lifeline and experiencing the last moments of their life. Not fun. So when I did that, I experienced the last moments of this thing's life being tortured for information by our government. I was so terrified. I snapped back out of that thing. Like I started crying and shaking, like shaking. Mm -hmm. They're going to kill me. I just know it. I'm dead. I'm a dead woman. (sighs) Off we go into another whole section coming up out of the depths and more towards the front where I would consider more like NORAD. You know, the observation, the listening post or whatever, all the different governments has representatives in NORAD. I don't know if you guys know that, but the United States is not the only people who occupy NORAD. Um, There's all kinds of people there. And so... All kinds of beings, apparently, as well. All kinds of beings, too, apparently. But all kinds of people from different nations there in in NORAD. And so I was taken to a room. We walked back to the back of the room. I sat down at at the end of a long over table. And these two men in black stood behind me, just standing there. Mm -hmm. I was made to wait for about 45 minutes in which I contemplated all the many ways that they were probably going to kill me. And I couldn't figure out how I'd I'd ended up in this situation. And just running everything over my head and just sitting there wringing my hands and being just really like, what is God, what is going on? Why why did they do this to you? Yeah, why are they doing this to me? Why are they... The point of showing you all this stuff. What is the point? Exactly. And so about 45 minutes later, um, somebody walks in the room and he is wearing a aviation jumpsuit. Okay. But it's the color of the Navy, not the Air Force. That confused me for many years until I talked to um, Randy Kramer when I found out that the Navy runs the secret space program. Okay. Um, And he walks in. So all rank insignia patches removed. I had no idea who this person was. And he walks in. He had an air of high-ranking official, like even above that. You know what I mean? Like this person was somebody. And you could feel it when they walked in the room. And he walked in and he sat down on the opposite end from me. And he crossed his legs and he looked at me for a long moment. And I'm leaning forward in my seat like, it's about to happen. And I, I why am I here? Mm-hmm. And he just leans back and looks at me for a long time. And he said, now, you know, stop digging. Now that I know what Hmm. I've been dragged all over this mountain for the past six hours. Yeah. Showing all these different things. But they're they're like puzzle pieces and you don't know what it all means. Yeah. Right. What does all of this mean? I don't understand it. And then he starts to name my adopted parents and where they live. They had just gotten a divorce and they, he, he knew the address and names of both my adopted mom and dad. Yeah. I just found my biological family, my biological mother and her partner. And he named their names and where they live. And my biological grandmother in Orlando. And I was just like, what's happening here? I'm definitely being threatened, but I don't understand for why. Mm-hmm. I really didn't. I really, I couldn't. Now that I know what, I don't know anything. I'm completely confused. I think you're going to kill me. This is what I was saying at this point. And, and, and I'm terrified. And then the next thing I remember at that point, back then, my memory was cut short and I've had more segments come in later on. And in 2012, I had memory when I was doing some um, inner child work with a shaman I was just sitting there and all of a sudden that memory got unlocked and I'm sitting, I'm back in that room. So let me just rewind because 
So you're saying you you went through this inner child unlocking of your memory. And I'm, that- I'm getting it doubled up. So let me let me go back to I'm sitting in the chair and he just said, now that you know, stop digging. Basically, he wanted me to stop calling people. He wanted me to stop calling people in the unit. What is this Zeta reticuli thing? Why is the government doing this? How do they have why do they have access to us, our personnel, military personnel? What is going on? And they, he was basically stop making those phone calls and stop digging. Stop asking after this. Stop it. And I, the next thing I remember is standing in the middle of the apartment complex that I went and got after that, right after that. I came to just standing in the apartment complex, which is in the apartment, which was now empty, except for my stuff that was laying in the middle of the living room floor. And I'm looking down. And the last thing I remember is I was sitting at the table in NORAD and I look at my clock, my watch, it's eight o'clock at night. What in God's name just happened with the last eight hours? And so I had the most powerful feeling of running. I came out of that with the most base desire to run and hide. Okay. And so I left, I actually packed all my stuff. I left Colorado Springs and I went traveling for about 10 years. I went from, I was so terrified and even driven at a subconscious level of what had happened in NORAD and everything had led led up to that. I wanted to forget about it. I wanted to shove it down really, really deep. And I went on the run for about 10 years. Well, in a sense, maybe that's what they wanted. They wanted to sort of um, traumatize you with the truth because you, you already had this experience. You remembered these experiences anyway. Um, it's an interesting technique and maybe they have a long-term uh, reason for doing that. I'm, I'm going to quickly open up the phone line. So you guys have a few minutes to call in if you want. The number is 855-472-5483 for the Paranormal Radio app line. That's 85KGRA live. And, um, and we do want to get to these pictures, Sierra. So these are some of the ones that you sent me of the dark side of the moon. Yes. Now, where, where did this come from? So I, over the years of doing the radio programs and stuff like that, I have a lot of people who follow me through social media and so on. Mm -hmm. And if you see at the bottom of the picture, I believe it, no, not on this particular picture. This one was actually sent to me from a friend with a a telescope. You can see a little bit of a stamp at the upper left-hand side of that picture. Mm -hmm. But it's a a person who has uh, a YouTube channel and who actually goes on with their own telescope and films the dark side of the moon when they can at this particular time of the year and sees see you can see those all the lights and so on between the dark and the light side and that the cities have grown so much over these last hundred years or whatever that and our technology has gotten so good that with this this person's home telescope they were able to take these pictures and sent them to me they sent them to a follower of mine and then that follower sent them to me Okay, so anyone who's listening on KGRA, if you want to check out these images, just jump over to the KGRA YouTube channel or on Facebook where this is streaming. Um, And if you're listening to this afterward as a podcast, you can do the same thing. Uh, So we have these three images here. Now, I know that when um, a recent, I think it was, was it Indian? Maybe someone who's listening can correct me. Uh, You know, probe landed on the the moon. There was like this kind of strange plasma glass-like material that was reflect um that reflected light or refracted it um and so you know i wonder you know are they covering something up or was there actually some kind of plasmic material um and could this be that it looks like a lot um i I don't know but it also reminds me a bit of um of pluto right so, I see what I see what you're saying, but what what people that have like seriously and this again, I encourage you all to go dig on the internet. Just look up the dark side of moon pictures. Any go on YouTube and and there's a lot of people now spending a lot of their time. And we're talking about amateur ast- astronomers, amateur people watching the international international space station and taking video of the different craft when they try and then they try to cut the feed. There's a lot of people now doing their own watchdog things, and this is lights that have expanded over the years and this particular person is like documented um how these of these lights have gotten sort of creeping around towards the front side of the moon yeah and if i'm not if i'm not if i'm correct on the top left at least for me um there's a little bit of light at the it looks like at the pole 
Mm-hmm. See that at the top left? Yep. Hand? Yep. So you're saying um, the, the, that the plasma does, doesn't glow that color also. Uh, I did do some research into that. It, it, grow, it glows a different color and has some to do with the particular chemical makeup of that particular plasma thing that you, that they were referencing, trying to actually throw us off the, off the scent of that. There's basically um, domes, even mm-hmm. on the front side, on some of the areas of the front side of the moon that have actually broken down of old civilizations and different things that are on the side that face us. And we, there is, you know, our Apollo missions and so on. And they went there because they were, they were looking for that. I mean, the, they went there also because they came, they came back at looking for um, a crashed uh, uh, spaceship on the moon there that they went in and they found that person. They sent, uh, Buzz up there, Aldrin, mm-hmm. and he came out on his deathbed and said, "We went and got an alien woman and brought her back from this ship." Um, and it, it's just there. Gosh, there's so much. I've just spent an extraordinary amount of time researching all of this. There's got to be other people who know something about this or can wish, come up with facts. I wish we had another hour, Sierra, because <laughs> we could get into a lot of stuff because you know the. the but we have a little last question here before the clock runs out. Um, and this is from Neutron in the chat room on KGRADB.com. Uh, the A-tip boys say they are interdimensional and negative, while the now defunct TTSA boys say that they are extraterrestrials and are a threat. Uh, which camp are you presently with um, in your present path? I believe there's both because I've actually come across them now. You know, this particular experience with NORAD and, and being taken in Colorado Springs was 31 years ago. Mm-hmm. And since then, I've come across other beings. And I had mentioned and alluded to that I've been taking up in craft and talked to these other uh, watchers, the uh, governors, uh, wardens, if you will, of, of this of different solar systems. And I believe that there is an entire faction that is completely power hungry and driven for their own self-serving needs. And then I believe the good ones, the ones that are coming in now, have come into our solar system and demanded that our governments give disclosure and tell the people what's going on. Um, there, there's, there are those also. Then we talk about the inner Earth, our our <laughs> Captain Bird flying into the North Pole. Oh, I have a picture of that, too kind of cool big old giant hole in our north section of our of our uh, planet and he flew in there and even with the the tech you know because um congressional congress what was this this hearing that we that 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 the a lot of the ufologist people put together and they brought forward all of these um testimonies from all the different people through the government and they had it in front of our own either house or senate hearing it was an actual hearing for evidence for ufo and disclosure the stephen greer the that yeah i believe it was the congressional congress of something something anyway there's been so many whistleblowers and so many people coming forward and talking about how these programs have existed and it's different things have been going on and this year is it i'm telling you, you all just it start doing your own work to prepare yourself because I believe this planet isn't just a very unique position. And then we've got a lot of observation we've got. So I was going on to say that there's inner earth people too, yeah. uh, like societies that have tried to take our attention away from them by like putting UFOs up in the sky. Look up there. We don't want you to know that we're down here yeah. because we're known as the violent surface dwellers. Sierra, did, did Buzz Aldrin die? Or is it another astronaut? Because I, I thought Buzz Aldrin was still alive. Oh, is he? I thought I thought so. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, it's been a rough, long year this yeah. year. Yeah. No. So was it someone else on their on their deathbed that said that? Said what? About going up and grabbing the uh, mm, yeah. the or, woman from the. Let me grab that information and I'll send it to you. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe, and maybe he just said it, um, you know, and because he's he's 90 years old or should be 90 years old. Um, so maybe he's just gotten to that point where it's like, hey, I'm just going to, you know, I have nothing else to hide anymore. Um, it seems yeah. to be a lot of people in the military uh, and uh, astronauts, as they as they get older, they decide that, you know, I, I've, I've, I've done my duty. Um, I've, I've served honorably. And this is something that the people need to know. 
Um, so I'm always interested to hear those those kinds of stories. Um, well, let's really quick. We've got like a minute. Uh, so this is from I think is this Egypt? No, this is the Nazca. They, there was a cave in Nazca in 2018 that they went in and found these artifacts, including supposedly a uh, barely alive alien. Okay. And who, all right, so who grabbed these? these so who? on those, um, on the pictures that I sent, there's an at, there's an actual capture of people's uh, the oh. name of the person. Okay, here we go. They're Alan Perez Munez. Gotcha. Yeah. And he had posted these back in into 2018, beginning of 2019. And then um, I got the pictures. Somebody sent them to me. And then I verified them with my partner on the ground. I was telling you about Dr. Aaron Nell, an in, in, uh, in Egyptologist in, in, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And she was in Portland in 2019. And I was there and we went through these. I have a lot more of those photos, actually, including video and stuff like that. And walking in there and seeing the alien. I mean, if these are legit, this is like mind blowing. No, it's mind blowing. It's, mo it's most mind blowing recent discovery that they've tried to uh, suppress. Um, and then supposedly and then I just messaged my friend in Egypt and said, because uh, somebody sent me a picture of a blue it's a, a lot like what they found in Nazca, this blue being blue looks sort of, but has harsher like bone structure than the Zetas, um, but bigger head, skinnier neck and body and arms, but it has a really blue tint to it. Um, and she said, we've had a lot of security concerns in the last couple of months. As soon as it starts to calm down, I will go to the minister of antiquities and ask him if he will verify that because I sent her the picture and everything. So, all right, Sierra, thank you so much for this conversation tonight. I really enjoyed it. There, there was so much that we didn't cover. I'm sorry we, we didn't get to. I'm, uh, I'm willing to come back on anytime. Sure. We, there's so much to dive into. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with the last word. So if you want to share something with the audience, um, now's your chance. There is a purpose for all of this. It's not to scare you all. It's not to say that we're all going to die and be taken over by these bad alien elements. There's good and bad out there. But the hope that I have is that we come through all of this as a society and we join our galactic brothers and sisters on the galactic scale. And we understand what all is out there and we're giving the information and given the ability to evolve and accept this new realm of possibility. And um, it's all our own work to get ourselves ready. Yeah. And I would just say, do your own work, dive into it, answer it, try to get as many questions as you can answer. But here pretty soon, all of it is going to come to the surface. And I believe it starts this year. I'm looking forward to it. And I, and I hope it, it comes smoothly rather than um, roughly. Thank you, Sierra, so much. Have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Okay, this is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now on KGRA Radio. Thank you all for joining tonight. Um, peace and love to you all. Let's 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 uh, let's be one. And uh, as always, you've been listening. Well, no, not as always. Actually, it's Sunday night. This is so cool. So now you are listening to Paranormal Now on Sunday night, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesdays on KGRADB.com, your official contact for the best in alternative talk radio. To find out more, go to KGRA, uh, KGRADB.com slash Paranormal Now or on Twitter at Paranormal underscore now. And uh, special thanks to Head of Operations, Eric Brager, and our producer, uh, Bill Skywasher, who is just always on his game. Thanks so much, Bill. Appreciate it. And to all of you out there, live in the mystery. <laughs>